This micro lecture is about aquatic biomass and urban wastes. When you have an opportunity, I would like you to click on the provided links and read about the algal housing project in Germany. It is a fascinating applied utilization of algal bioreactor technology. Please take a moment and review this week's learning objectives. For our purposes, aquatic biomass is defined as crops produced using aquaculture or harvested from lakes and oceans. We will focus on three main types, macroalgae, microalgae, and floating plants. The difference between macroalgae and microalgae is that macroalgae are big organisms like seaweed and kelp, but microalgae are single-celled organisms like spirulina and chlorella. Even though we like to think of algae as being advanced, macroalgae like kelp and seaweed have been cultivated at larger scales for centuries. Kelp and seaweed are commercially harvested from the ocean and commercially farmed all over the world. This algae is largely used for food, chemicals, and cosmetics, but not yet as an energy source. As a potential source of biomass for bioenergy, it has some interesting attributes. It grows very, very fast, with kelp being one of the fastest growing photosynthetic organisms on Earth. It is also very digestible because it has no lignin, and it has the potential to be grown at high densities in very small areas due to its ocean habitat. However, at the moment it is quite expensive, stores badly, and isn't cultivated at the scales that would be necessary for it to make sense as a bioenergy crop. Microalgae are a little more advanced than macroalgae because they are harder to cultivate and harvest at large scales. That said, just like macroalgae, it's still a very old crop, since spirulina was a food source for the Aztecs and other Mesoamericans until the early 16th century. The algae harvest from Lake Texcoco and subsequent sale as algae cakes were described by conquistadors during the early periods of Central and South American exploration. Macroalgae, like kelp and seaweed, may be easier to grow commercially, but microalgae has been in the spotlight because their potential strengths are very notable. They currently support the highest estimated biomass yield per acre. They are one of the most digestible sources of biomass. They are fairly easy to pump and process without size reduction, and they are one of few biomass sources with the potential for total nutrient recycle. By this, I mean we could harvest algae, remove the products we want, and then just return the nutrients right to the ponds all at the same location. Nutrient recycle is something that eludes most sources of biomass. However, growing algae right now is extremely expensive. So, inspens so expensive, in fact, that those potential strengths don't make up for it just yet. As we improve our methods of cultivation, harvest, and product recovery, this will be a source of biomass to watch closely. Floating plants are an interesting biomass to consider in so much as they are invasive, they grow fast, and they are fairly easy to harvest. Many of the waterways and shallow water bodies in the United States struggle with floating plants. If they could be leveraged as a source of biomass for bioenergy, it would be a constructive development. The primary challenges that would have to be overcome are related to storage, density, and size of resource. Any solution taking advantage of floating plants would have to be appropriately sized to fit the resource and the speed it was growing at. Despite these challenges, the strengths make floating plants important as a potential regional source of biomass in some places. So where does kelp grow? Kelp grows in pretty much all of the coastal regions on Earth particularly the ones that have cold water or cold water and warm water mixing. It is the bamboo of the sea in terms of growth rates. This map was generated based on global aquatic plant harvest data per country from 2012. Most of what is shown on this map is seaweed and kelp or macroalgae. The highest per country production is from China at around 13 million tons a year. Comparatively, global microalgae production is much smaller and more on the order of about 100,000 tons per year. Microalgae is very expensive stuff at around $2,000 a ton, compared to the $70 a ton for forest and field biomass. 
Landfills are frequently in the news because no one wants them to be nearby. However, we all generate trash, and to keep our cities and towns clean, landfills have been a necessary development. From a bioenergy perspective, they are also an excellent source of biomass and carbon if you can engineer a way to deal with its unpredictable composition and level of contaminants. The only solution for trash for decades has been to landfill it or incinerate it, but this is changing. The size of the carbon reserve, the fact they are so consolidated, and their frequent presence near urban areas is making landfills the target for a variety of bioenergy companies. Like microalgae, this will be an area to watch closely. The largest landfills in America bring in about 3 million tons of trash a year. The table shown above is 2010 data, so it is dated, but it provides a good reference point for what big landfills are doing these days. In some ways, landfills represent the largest consolidation of biomass that developed nations undertake. There is no other source of biomass that compares on a tonnage per acre per day scale, other than maybe food. It is also important to remember that this is wet weight, and the waste is probably very wet, so more than half the weight is likely water. Believe it or not, it is extremely difficult to find a good map of the location of all of the landfills in the U.S. It is even hard to find current size data so that you could make your own map. As a result, we will have to settle for an EPA landfill map based on CO2 emissions. It is interesting to note that the highest density of landfills is co-located with the highest population density up and around the East Coast, but the largest landfills are located in areas with very low population around the Southwest. This is because the nearby areas of high population are paying to have their trash transported to these remote locations. That is worth thinking about. This topic is gross to some people but it is important. We all poop because we are unable to convert 100% of the biomass we consume into energy and human mass. This actually leaves quite a bit of leftover biomass that we flush and send to the wastewater treatment plant. At the wastewater treatment plant, much of the biomass is converted into bacterial biomass, so the solids remaining are primarily bacteria and undigestible biomass, like wood and paper. This is a great source of biomass that is utilized for biogas and gets a lot of interest. I also think it is interesting to consider that wastewater sludge may be the only easily available large-scale source of bacterial biomass. Far from being gross, this could actually be quite useful because bacterial cells are very unique, giving this source of biomass potential for unusual conversions. There are a lot of parallels between landfill waste and wastewater sludge, so lessons learned in one area may be able to be applied to the other. Wastewater sludge, also known as biosolids, are a fairly concentrated source of biomass, somewhere on the order of 7 to 8 million dry tons a year these days. That isn't nearly as much as landfills, but it is a significant source of fairly homogeneous biomass generally located next to urban centers. In closing, I would like you to consider some of these things about aquatic and urban biomass. Aquatic biomass is very expensive. It won't always be, but right now it is. And urban wastes are extremely cheap, but very difficult to work with. Aquatic and urban biomass are unconventional sources of biomass, right now. They are also some of the most concentrated sources of biomass available to us, certainly in urban areas. As a source of biomass, they are generally more expensive to process into the correct shape and composition than biomass sourced from forests and fields. And above all, they have an extremely high potential for carbon and nutrient recycling. This is a picture of the halophyte Salicornia Bigelovi. When you have an opportunity, please go to the provided link and read about some of the recent bioenergy developments using crops that grow in salt water. Imagine not needing fresh water to water your crops. This would dramatically change our agricultural paradigm.